So hello and welcome to this discussion-based podcast on Upper GI Bleed. I'm Rashmi Patel. And I'm Ed Wallach. And in this uh, podcast, we're going to go through, uh, the first of all, the causes of uh, acute upper GI bleed, um, the clinical features, uh, and uh, how you should manage a patient in the emergency department who presents uh, with an upper GI bleed. And then finally, a brief discussion on prognosis with the Rockall score. So first of all, let's start with uh, some of the common causes of upper GI bleed. Now, by far the commonest cause is bleeding from a peptic ulcer. Um, and uh, basically, an ulcer, ulceration is uh, just damage to an epithelialized surface. Um, and in the gastric and duodenal mucosa, this is caused by inadequate protection from stomach acid. And there are a number of risk factors which can lead to ulceration, uh, including H. pylori infection, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids, and smoking. Uh, now, as an ulcer continues to erode into the mucosa, what will eventually happen is that the underlying blood vessels uh, within the mucosa will become exposed to the stomach contents, the acid contents, uh, and may bleed into the stomach, uh, causing an upper GI bleed. Yeah. So here we have an example uh, of endoscopic view of a duodenal ulcer, and you can see this nasty ulcerated lesion um, and if that were to progress and um, eventually expose a blood vessel, that could bleed. Yeah, I think it's worth saying here that um, the other complication or key complication of an ulcer is a perforation. Yes, of course. If yeah. it goes all the way through. Yeah. And there are sort of two characteristic directions in the duodenum that um, ulcers can, can go. Um, if you've got one that travels anteriorly, Mm -hmm. um, the, they say that the characteristic you will get a perforation. Right. Well, if you have one that's on the posterior wall of the duodenum, then the because the gastroduodenal artery runs just behind the posterior wall of, of, of the one yeah. of the duodenum, you more likely to get to so get a bleed from that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that's 100 percent true, but, but um, yeah, they say those good, are the two sort of patterns. Yeah. So the other big cause, or another really big cause of the upper GI bleed is the presence of esophageal um, varices, and this accounts for about 10% of upper GI bleed. Obviously, most esophageal varices are present because of the existence of coexistent chronic liver disease that leads to um, distortion of liver architecture and shunting of blood into various systems, one of which, importantly, is the lower esophagus, um, where you get dilatation of veins um, at the sites of portosystemic anastomosis, of which the lower esophageal junction um, is one. Um, the problem is, is that these lower esophageal um, dilated tortuous veins are very friable and can easily um, rupture. And this can result in really very, very severe torrential upper GI bleeding. And even if the torrential upper GI bleeding is not enough to do significant harm to the patient, often these patients with chronic liver disease then unfortunately go on to also develop um, acute hepatic failure yes. uh, as, a, as a complication um, as well. So it's quite a se severe condition. And here is a, it's an endoscopic view of the lower esophagus and I think you can see those multiple protrusions um, into the um, esophagus. Those are the dilated um, varicosities, the, um, the, uh, the varices. And you can also see uh, what, what's called a red sign which indicates a, a high risk um, of, of bleeding from those yes, that's right. Okay, moving on now to a Mallory Weiss tear. Uh, this is caused by a small tear in the esophagus uh, due to some kind of trauma, uh, be it forceful vomiting, retching or coughing, anything which increases uh, the intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, and this can result in a tear which uh, hits one of the blood vessels in the mucosa, causing bleeding into the esophagus. Uh, and here we see in this picture uh, a tear and uh, bleeding from this Mallory Weiss tear in this endoscopic view. And it's very common, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next is um, esophagitis. Um, and I think it should be said that esophagitis really has to be quite severe um, to, to cause a frank upper mm -hmm. um, GI bleed, but it's important to be aware of um, um, as a cause. Um, important causes of such esophagitis, well, perhaps the most important cause is gastroesophageal reflux disease um, that's associated with um, conditions such as um, hiatus, hernia, associated with um, obesity, increasing intra-abdominal pressure, um, and is probably one of the most 
common gastric conditions on a worldwide basis. Yes. Uh, other ones just to have in the back of your mind, um, esophageal candidiasis um, is a very severe condition, often associated with you know, suppression that can lead to very severe esophagitis. Uh, chemical erosion, so that's if um, a patient has swallowed um, corrosives, such yes. as household yeah. bleach, it's more common in kids actually, and can result in very severe strictures um, later on in life. And then finally, ionizing radiation, often, for example, for treatment, say, of um, neck malignancy or uh, laryngeal malignancy with high doses of radiation, can also result in um, localized esophagitis as well. And obviously, uh, where you've got continued inflammation on an epithelial surface, you can get points of bleeding, which can cause um, autogenic bleeding. Right. And finally, uh, quite a rare cause of of upper GI bleed, the Dulafoy's lesion, and I, I just mentioned this because this is the kind of thing which comes up in, in vivas and exams. Uh, now, this is caused by a prominent arterial uh, within the submucosa, typically near the gastroesophageal junction, and is actually able to bleed into the stomach in the absence of an overlying ulcer. And uh, what you'll see on endoscopy is you'll see just the spurt of blood coming out from the mucosa. Um, and underneath that is this bleeding arterial. Uh, and therapeutically, uh, you tend to use the same modalities uh, as you would do for treating uh, a bleeding peptic ulcer uh, in terms of uh, cautery or argon photocoagulation. Right, moving on now to the key cardinal features of upper GI bleed, and they are hematemesis and melina. So hematemesis, as the name suggests, is vomiting blood. Now, the form in which the blood takes can, can vary and can actually help to identify the, the underlying cause as well. Um, the patient might complain of, of actually vomiting up very fresh, bright red blood, um, or uh, they may start vomiting altered blood, which has been partially digested, um, or clots of blood. Um, and characteristically, we talk about this, this idea of this coffee ground vomiting. And um, this just describes the, the sort of small dark um, bits in the vomit, uh, which are all, bits of altered blood, which the patient vomits up. Uh, now, the second cardinal uh, feature of, of upper GI bleed is melina. And this is the uh, black, tarry, very foul smelling stool. And once you, you've seen it once, you will never forget it. Uh, yes, smell and, it and, and yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and this is uh, caused by digestion of blood within the GI tract, um, ca uh, causing this, uh, this melina uh, and is a cardinal feature of upper GI bleed. Yeah, so remember, try and remember both of those. Other features in the history which uh, you want to ascertain are whether there has been a previous history of peptic ulcer disease, because of course that makes it more likely that this is the cause of, of the current episode of GI bleeding. Um, any previous uh, infection with Helicobacter pylori, uh, history of esophagitis, uh, chronic liver disease in particular, which might make you think more towards variceal uh, uh, etiology, um, and any other medical comorbidities, because, of course, these have an impact on the overall prognosis of the patient. Um, in addition, uh, if the patient has had any previous surgery, that's very important to, to know about. Uh, if they've had a previous peptic ulcer, which has been excised, or a partial gastrectomy. And that's not only to help you um, try and point towards the underlying etiology, but um, also as all these patients will, will end up having uh, um, endoscopy, uh, it's important to let the endoscopist know uh, in case of any aberrant anatomy, particularly with any form of partial gastrectomy, so that uh, uh, they, they know what to expect when they when they go and have a look with the endoscope. Absolutely. So, in terms of your um, examination findings, um, the most important thing that you'll be looking for um, are signs that this patient is becoming hypovolemic because they're losing blood. Um, now, uh, there are lots of other podcasts on um, hypovolemia and the assessment of hypovolemia and shock on, on the website. But just to remind you, some of the earliest signs of um, hypovolemia are tachypnea, so an increased respiratory rate, um, cool periphery, the prolonged capillary refill time and pallor. Um, and some of these sort of later signs include a, a tachycardia and a hypotension. Uh, once again, something that I always mention, don't rely absolutely on hypotension. 
to um, diagnose shock because you actually need to lose about 30% of your circulating mm. volume before you become uh, hypotensive with a systolic less than 90. If you want to be a bit more sort of elegant about it, you, you can do a postural uh, blood pressure um, with the patient lying and sitting in bed. And if they have a, a, a systolic drop greater than 15 or 20 millimeters of mercury, you might say that that patient has a postural drop, and that's an earlier sign um, of hypovolemic shock. Obviously, um, because a significant proportion of upper GI bleeds are caused by bleeding esophageal varices, you should always assess to see if the patient has any signs of chronic liver disease. And starting um, at the hands and, and working up the arm and looking down, these are all the signs you should try and pick up on. Presence of jaundice, um, leukonychia, uh, clubbing, palmar erythema. The patient may have an asterixis or a flap, which is a very good sign of, say, decompensated um, liver disease. They may have facial telangiectasia or spider nevi on the upper abdomen. They may have uh, prominent breasts, gynecomastia. Indeed, they may have um, a very swollen, tense abdomen. It uh, may indicate um, the presence of ascites. And all of these things would make you wonder about the, the, the presence of esophageal varices as your cause of upper GI bleeding. In terms of the actual uh, examination of the abdomen itself, um, you may find lots and lots of different things um, in association with a um, uh, perhaps a, a bleeding peptic ulcer, there may be uh, or gastritis, there may be tenderness, epigastric tenderness, um, together with um, guarding. Um, in the context of liver disease, the patient may have hepatomegaly. Um, very rarely, and something we, we haven't spoken about, actually, a, a upper GRB can be caused by a gastric carcinoma. Mm -hmm, yes. um, and in this situation, you may find on examination an epigastric mass. It's very, very important to perform a rectal examination, um, primarily because the patient may actually not have told you that they've been getting um, melina. Um, and therefore, when you, when, you put your, 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 when you put your finger into the rectum, um, and inspect it afterwards, you may actually find traces of menina on, on the glove. Um, and also there may be fresh blood as well, which may indicate a, a, a lower gastrointestinal yes. source for, for, their, for their bleeding and shock. Okay, moving on now to the immediate management. And um, as Ed has stressed before, this is a medical emergency. Uh, anyone presenting with an upper GI bleed, you should uh, take an ABC approach uh, and resuscitate and you must get immediate senior help. Yeah, and if you and, take if you take nothing else yeah. away from this podcast, is anyone presenting with hematemesis or melina, you just have to do ABC, get access, give yeah. fluids, and, and get senior and get, help. Get help immediately. Yeah. So the immediate management, as for all patients, uh, is uh, high flow oxygen, large bore IV axis, and and this this is not with blue cannula in in the wrist. This is proper, you know, orange two orange cannulas at the antecubital fossae, um, and you, you may want to consider a central line as well, particularly in patients who have medical comorbidities like heart failure, so you can titrate uh, yeah, the fluid absolutely. with the, with the CVP. But um, even two large bore cannula in 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 the um, elbows is just as good in terms of fluid resuscitation. And uh, so you would resuscitate with IV fluids, uh, catheterize the patient, them onto urine output, uh, send off uh, blood tests, full blood count uh, to look for a drop in hemoglobin, renal function. And in particular here, what you, you often see, owing to the fact that you have blood within the GI tract, which is digested, um, you get uh, and, uh, protein rich, you get an increase in urea. Yeah. Very and that, that is disproportionate to the increase uh, in, in the creatinine. And that can be a useful guide um, and, and might be one of the first signs you see in someone who's got occult upper GI bleed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, of course, liver function, uh, clotting screen and uh, to cross match blood. Uh, and you would consider a blood transfusion if the patient was anemic and uh, fresh flows in plasma if their clotting was deranged. Uh, you would also give the patient an uh, oral proton pump inhibitor. Uh, and then if you have any suspicion of acute variceal bleed, uh, you might consider terlipressin, which is an ADH analogue um, and uh, is selectively vasoconstricts uh, the vessels which are um, thought to be involved in uh, the, the bleeding from these varices. 
You would probably also want to obtain um, abdominal film and erect chest film to exclude any possibility of perforation, particularly if yeah. someone who's got a peptic ulcer. And in any patient who uh, is hemodynamically unstable, despite having uh, attempts at resuscitating them, uh, an early ITU um, opinion is of vital importance, uh, and also to consider early surgical review uh, in, in patients who present with severe uh, upper GI bleeding. And finally, the, the very key point is that um, even if you resuscitated the patient to the point where, where now their vital signs are improving, you must regularly monitor and recheck they can those vital signs, yeah. and they can deteriorate very quickly. Yeah. In terms of further management, all of your, your, your resuscitation and your proton pump inhibitor and tolipressin, if they've got varices, everything is directed as a bridge to OGD. So OGD is um, esophagogastrojuvenoscopy. It's basically where you pass a fiber optic tube down into the um, into the stomach and it allows you to go as far as the as far as the end of the duodenum actually it allows you to visualize any gross pathology that's occurring in the upper GI tract so basically it allows you to make a diag a diagnosis um, of what's what the cause of the upper GI bleed is however the reason I say we direct towards it is because it's also a therapeutic tool yeah it allows you to perform various therapeutic procedures that um, may be used to stop the bleeding and provide definitive management. And these include um, things such as adrenaline injection um, around the bleeding point. Obviously, this causes vasoconstriction, so it will reduce mm -hmm. blood loss. You can actually perform electrocoagulation. You can inject sclerosing um, agents or put bands around varices to um, sort of constrict them and, and prevent um, bleeding. And then l lastly, you can do more sort of fancy things such as argon photocoagulation, which yeah. I admit I know very little it's, about. Yeah, it's, about, it's similar to the electrocoagulation. It's to, to directed at the bleeding vessel to, to um, stop it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, prior to OGD, however, it's important that the patient remains hemodynamically stable. Um, this is really very important because patients often require sedation during OGD for the procedure to be a success, and you certainly don't want to be sedating someone who is hemodynamically That's unstable. Right. Yeah. Um, they should, of course, be known by mouth for at least six hours. This isn't usually a problem because patients are usually placed on by mouth as, as soon as they start vomiting. Yeah. Uh, the blood topical anesthesia spray is used to anesthetate the pharynx um, to allow the passage of a, a scope. IV sedation is given often in the form of um, midazolam. Um, and uh, OGD is associated with various risks. Um, there's obviously a, a risk of, of trauma, which can lead to actually bleeding itself. Yeah. Um, iatrogenic perforation of the esophagus or Boerhaave syndrome um, can also result from um, OGD and obviously you can get adverse reactions to the various uh, sedating agents together with um, respiratory depression which is often a side effect of these things um, as well. So OGD is a very very important um, tool both in diagnosis and treatment but always remember that it's not without um, its risk That's particularly yeah. in this population of patients mm -hmm. who are very unwell. Okay, and uh, moving on to management after endoscopy, I think the key point to remember here is that management of a patient with upper GI bleed does not end with endoscopy, no. uh, because of course there's always a risk of re-bleeding. So it's very important to continue to re-monitor vital signs, as we said earlier, uh, monitor the fluid balance and stool chart, and try and identify early um, if the patient has had any signs that they are re-bleeding, uh, for example, they have further episodes of melina. And should this occur, you, you approach it in exactly the same way as you did before, going through and uh, uh, assessing the airway, breathing and circulation uh, and resuscitation, get uh, early help and a very prompt surgical review uh, to consider whether the patient uh, uh, requires surgery to treat the cause yeah, of their re-bleeding. Um, and, and, and then, of course, management of the underlying cause. Uh, so we talked about the two commonest causes of uh, upper GI bleeding being from peptic ulcers and uh, from varices. Uh, and the next slide uh, describes um, further management of both of these. Uh, in peptic ulcer disease, uh, to, the first thing to think about is to, to um, stop any predisposing drugs, uh, aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and uh, patients on warfarin 
uh, certainly will stop the warfarin as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, in addition to that, uh, the patient should be tested and treated for Helicobacter pylori, as that's a, a great risk factor for continued mm. peptic ulcer disease um, and, and continued with a proton pump inhibitor. Um, should rebleeding occur, uh, as we've already mentioned, you should obtain a prompt surgical review uh, and the surgeons may consider angiography um, to actually look and try and identify if there's a particular vessel causing the bleed and then this, this vessel uh, could be coiled in order to, to try and cease the bleeding or, or surgical um, uh, underrunning of the ulcer. Uh, or even gastrectomy if or, yes. severe. Yeah. Now for variceal bleeding, uh, uh, continued um, management is, is directed at, well, there's two, two areas actually. The firstly at the varices themselves uh, with um, vasoconstrictive drugs like telepressin. Um, antibiotics uh, owing to the, the risk of infection, particularly in this group of patients who have, um, who may, who have chronic liver disease and may end up actually having decompensated liver disease in association with the variceal bleeding. Um, and, and further management with uh, uh, this thing called TIPS, the transdrugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Um, and what that is trying to do is to try and relieve the pressure from the portal system by creating um, uh, an artificial shunt uh, from the portal system to the systemic venous system, uh, which isn't, uh, um, uh, so, so to divert the blood away from these sites of portosystemic anastomosis, uh, and this this can allow uh, reduction in pressure and to relieve um, the pressure on, on the uh, varices. Ah, the Rockall score. So this is yes. a, another sort of well-known Viva stroke Paces question. That's the right. Rockall score is one of yes. the scoring systems that's used to both stratify the risk of a patient uh, of a patient uh, rebleeding and also to look at the prognosis among patients with a GI bleed. Now, I don't think you need to know the details of a Rockwell score, indeed, to be able to calculate no, from memory. No, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be able to memorise. I think it's useful to know what makes up the Rockwell score, because often it will be part of a, um, of a patient's presentation to you or a handover, perhaps, if you're the house officer looking after them or, yeah. or the SHO. So the Rockwell score comprises two separate scores, one given prior to endoscopy, so during the resuscitation phase, and one given at endoscopy, which is often called the post-endoscopy score. So the one given pre-endoscopy is based upon the age of the patient, the presence of shock, and the various comorbidities. And you can see here the various important things. Obviously, patients who are older will have a worse prognosis. Patients who have very severe shock reflecting Increased blood loss have a worse prognosis, and patients with renal or liver failure as comorbidities have a much worsened prognosis. And then the second part of the score is based on the findings of um, OGD and the events that occur um, after OGD. So, for example, if the diagnosis is something very simple like a Mallory Weiss tear, then the patient won't score any additional points for that. But if they have a, a malignancy, if they have visible vessels, adherent clots, that kind of thing at endoscopy, then that suggests that there is a worse prognosis for the patient and an increased risk of um, re-bleeding. And here you can see pre-endoscopy, the kind of figures we're talking about. So that someone who has a rock all score, say, of one, has a 3% mortality, but going up to, right up to seven, so that's your patient who's hypotensive, old, and who has liver disease, their mortality can be up to, say, 75 A huge difference. Huge, Absolutely. huge difference. Yeah. And then post-endoscopy, this is the score that allows you to both classify the risk of re-bleed and also to look at their uh, mortality. And once again, the difference here is, is, is huge. Look, there's very little findings at endoscopy. The re-bleed risk is very, very low and the mortality is very, very low. But if the findings of visible vessels and, 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 and clots um, are present, even with therapeutic interventions, the risk of mm. re-bleed and the mortality is, is very, very high. So to summarise, in this podcast on upper GI bleeding, uh, we've discussed the, uh, the, the most important causes, uh, including peptic ulcer disease and esophageal varices, um, and the cardinal symptoms of upper GI bleeding, namely hematemesis and melina.
Uh, and then we, we've spoken in quite some depth in, in, into the immediate management and uh, the most important key point to take away from this uh, is that upper GI bleeding is a medical emergency. You must assess the patient's airway, breathing, circulation, correct these and resuscitate the patient and get senior help immediately. And then um, ongoing management with endoscopy uh, and potentially surgery if uh, there's any uh, re-bleeding. And then the Rockwell score as a tool for assessing prognosis uh, before and, and after endoscopy. So I hope this uh, has been a useful overview to approaching patients who, are, who present with hematemesis and melina. Um, and thank you very much for listening. See you soon.